Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is pool and poker player Tupé J. Helferts. How are Jay, you? We're, we're fine. Um, tell me how you got the name Tupé J. Well, like, like, many, like many young men, uh, not really that many, but I was prematurely balding. I was actually losing hair when I was in my early 20s, and I come from the, uh, 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 the hippie generation of the 60s and 70s when long hair was in. And it was very embarrassing to me, and I was very uh, uncomfortable with it. So when I was 22 years old, I had a toupee made. And I had already been playing pool for several years since I was 18 and gambling at it. And I found, I discovered, this was happened by accident, that as soon as I put a toupee on and went back someplace that I hadn't been in in a year, People did not recognize me. They didn't know that it was me. And kind of accidentally, um, I played the same guys that I might have won money from two, three years before. And I had the, the on more than one occasion where a guy said, you know, you look familiar to me, but I can't place you. And <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, you know, a lot of people say that. And so it happened by accident that wearing a toupee was advantageous to me in the pool world. It was a good disguise. I put on a toupee and I grew a mustache, and people didn't know I, I was the same guy. They may have played a couple of years before. And there was a pool player from uh, from Arizona, um, Sean Walsh, they called Arizona Sean, uh, who saw me come into a pool room and uh, get in a game and he yelled out across the room, watch out, you're in a game with Toupee J. <laughs> and that name stuck. I hated that name. I hated that name. But it stuck. And years later, I got to where I was comfortable with it because everybody knew that name. That's that's great. So you, you mentioned starting at 18, but um, you must have started playing pool before that. I mean, 18 would be really late to start, wouldn't it? Yep. I was a late starter. I did play pool when I was in my teens at friends' homes and stuff like that. But where I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, um, you couldn't go in a pool room till you were 18 years old. There were very, uh, very strict restrictions against it. Although I did get in when I was like 17, but I didn't really seriously start playing pool um, till I was a freshman in college. I was 18 years old when I, and I was a late start because. Most of the top players started playing pool when they were 12 and 13. Did you teach yourself or did you have mentors? Basically, I had to learn on my own. I don't know how how, how it really was in the poker world, but in the pool, the, the older – they didn't want to teach you. They, they didn't want you to learn their secrets. They, you had to learn on your own. So my mentors were really guys that I just did – I observed how they played and what they did, and I learned by kind of osmosis more than anything else. So when you when you were starting out and you you started hustling, what was the popular game to play? Where was the money? Was it nine ball back then? It's you know what that's never changed. The biggest games when I was eighteen and nineteen were nine ball in one pocket. They remain that way today. Um, but you said when I was hustling, I was the one getting hustled when I was 18 and 19. Sure. It took me a good three years of obsession with pool. And I'm by obsession, I mean I played all day long, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And maybe it took three years till I was like 21, where now I was a winning player. There's a long learning curve in pool. It's not easy. You don't catch on quick. Yeah, well, it's a very precise skill. You you can't. Yeah, you can't. It takes time to to. It, it, I would liken it to golf, right? You're going to spend. Yeah, fair, I was just going to say that it's it's more akin to a game like golf or tennis. It's people think look at pool and they say, oh, this is a game. Let me tell you, it's very much a physical activity. It combines the mental and the physical very well. 
So did you then start hustling? Did you go on the road? What what was your path at that? Yeah, point? well, that's that's what the that's the natural progression in pool is as you get better and you can beat everybody in your pool room, your local pool room. You go looking for games other places. I didn't. I was never a hustler per se. I went to other rooms and asked to play. I said, I'm looking for somebody that wants to play. That was the quickest way. Don't get me wrong. There's a, there were a lot of pool hustlers, but I wasn't one of them. I wanted to play every day. I wanted to get a game, and the easiest way for me to get a game was to go in a pool room and say, I'm looking for a game. Typically, the response you would get from the houseman, the person behind the counter, was, are you a good player? And my stock response was, I play okay. Huh. Now, did you make more money playing pool or arranging games and backing others? Well, I actually made the most money in my career in pool, owning pool rooms. That's uh-huh. what I did good at. But, no, I, I to answer that specific question, I won more money being a backer than a pool player because I, I – got involved in some big scores that way but also i mean i just you know when you read books about pool uh there's so much kind of cheating and backstabbing and and dumping on the backer and (laughs) i mean how did you avoid those kind of traps well you can't avoid them all you learn through experience richard and in that respect it's kind of a lot like poker you know you, after you get dumped a couple times, then you find out what's really going on, and you have to you have to you have to be cautious and you have to be aware. You learn you learn how to take care of yourself, just like you do in all other aspects of the gambling world. Now, going back, I'll, I'll backtrack a second about gambling and winning, making money, playing pool. I was focused when I was in my 20s on just making a living at pool. And back then, when I was a young man, and I'm going back 40 and 50 years ago, if you made 25 or $50 a day, you could live good. And I could do that. That's all I was doing was surviving. The biggest pool games I've ever played have been $1,000 a game, personally. I've played $1,000 a game a few times, which is a pretty big game, but not the biggest games. What are the, what are the biggest games where you were the backer fifty thousand dollars i was involved in i might have had a piece of it like maybe i took half of it or many times when they're many times when they're big games even to this day where fifty or a hundred thousand dollars a bet it's a group of people put up the money i might take five thousand of the action or ten thousand of the action like that and i still do get involved in games like that to this day so I, I've been hearing I, – now, I don't know about since COVID, but I've been hearing stories about enormous games that have been going on here in Vegas at a at a club on Decatur. I think it's called Grift or Grifters. That's it, Griff's, Griff's Pool Room. Yeah, it's true. And they actually continued even do th- during COVID for a period of time. A lot of those games centered around a, a, a well-known poker player, um, Jean Robert. We call him in the pool world. He's known as Big Bobby because he's, you know, he's like six foot five inches tall. And uh, um, John Rover, Dippy Dave, these are some of the people that got involved in, let's just say, six figure action. And when they and when they have these giant games, I mean, there's cash up on the light above the table, or. I mean, no, it just it's seems not like, on the light above the table, but it's there in the pool room. It just seems they carry like it in, they carry it in in backpacks and stuff like that. Money does change hands. It just seems Real money. like a huge danger of, you know, a, a stick-up kind of thing. There's a danger involved, but the, the guys that handle the big money have some, have protection with them. Let's just say that. They have some level of security. And even at the pool room, there's additional security. There's armed security. Huh. So, you know, all I can say is uh, buyer beware to anybody that tries to rob. It's like robbing a big poker game. You might get shot. Do you see much commonality between pool and poker? 
Well, in, in terms of gambling, like, like the games that Richard's asked me about, it's not much different than the challenge matches we see today in poker, you know, the, like the one we just had, Helmuth with Negrano, or Negrano against Doug Polk. Um, they're, they're set, these are matches that are arranged, and we know at the beginning, what we call it in pool, we call it how much money is in the middle. And a big match might have 50,000 each side. So they say there's 100,000 in the middle. But there may be a quarter million or more bet on the side. And those bets are made on the Internet. They're made in the pool room um, where the match is going on. I mean, if you go to Griff's when there's a big match going on, it's not hard to get a, a, a one or two or five thousand dollar side bet on that match. So in that way, they're very similar. Hmm. And the, a lot of the poker players play pool and vice versa? Yes, they do. A lot of the poker players that don't play pool will bet on pool matches. They'll be side bettors. They're looking, they're looking for side action. The hot, the probably the two poker, two most well-known poker players today who also bet high at pool are John Hennigan and Nick Schulman both of whom were very good pool players when they were young men. Nick Schulman was considered the best teenage pool player in all of New York City when he was like 17, 18 years old. John Hennigan's first nick now they call him Johnny World in poker, but his first nickname around, around uh, Philadelphia was Cornflakes. And <laughs> he, was, he was backed by mobsters in Philadelphia, when he was only 18, 19 years old, he was playing pool games for tens of thousands of dollars. Now, you mentioned that you owned pool rooms. Where where were your pool rooms? And did they uh, cater and, to these kind of high rolling? Yeah, sure. My first pool room was in Bakersfield, California in the 1970s. And it was an action room mainly because of me. I was on every roadman in his little black book because they knew that if they went to Jay's cue ball, it's called the cue ball in Bakersfield, they would get a game. I would play anybody that came in for a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, maybe five hundred dollars. So I would give them action. But there were other games that went on there. Um, it was that in pool. That's how a roadman operated. He would go from stop to stop and city to city. It's not like poker where you can go to a card room and get a game. You had to go to the different pool rooms to get action. Yeah, no, it's more like the modern-day card counters who have to constantly be on the road because they're, you know, getting thrown out. Um, I don't think of Bakersfield as the hotbed of, of gambling, so that's Listen, amusing. Sh- it's strange, but, like, some of the biggest pool games have happened in places like Medford, Oregon, and uh, um, all throughout the South. The southern part of the United States from, like, Texas going east has always been a hotbed for pool action. To this day, there are pool room tournaments, and I say tournaments because the tournaments are the smallest part of the action, where they do Calcuttas. The Calcutta could have $100,000 in it, where if you pick the winning player, you might win $40,000. That happens right now in 2021. Did so, you get into tournament play yourself? Yes, I did. Not a lot, but I did. I became more well-known as a tournament organizer and tournament director, but I played in pool tournaments. I I was a kind of a journeyman in tournaments uh, where I might get in the money. I might finish 16th or 17th or 24th, but uh, and I did win matches against top players occasionally, but I was never... I was never a top tournament player. I was more well known as a as a as a gambler, a money player. A famous movie is called The Color of Money. Uh, do you know anything about that? Well, I know about it very well. Um, I was working as a tournament director of the U.S. Open in 1986, and um, the owner of the pool room, Q Master Billiards in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, said there's a couple guys coming in here that are interested in making a movie about Walter Tevis's book, The Color of Money, and I'd like you to meet them. And he introduced me to 
Martin Scorsese, the director, who I had no idea who he was. And he introduced me to Tom Cruise, who was there with Martin Scorsese. And the only knowledge I had of Tom Cruise at the time is that he was in this kids movie called Risky Business. And when I met Tom Cruise, I said, aren't you the guy that was dancing around in his underwear in that movie? <laughs> and Tom said, yeah, that's me. And I spent a day with Tom Cruise uh, sitting in the stands watching matches. And he was a very intelligent young man. Now, I think at that time he was like 24 years old. He asked me, why did they chalk their cue this way? Why did they take their cue apart this way? He, he asked me questions all day long about why the pool players did different things, and he was a quick study. Tom learned fast. If you told him one time, he remembered. But what was interesting is Martin Scorsese wanted to go into the back room. Most pool tournaments, like the U.S. Open, have a back room where the action games going on, go on, the money games. And, and Martin Scorsese wanted to get in there and watch money games. So I talked to Barry Berman who was the owner of the pool room, I said, is it okay if these guys go in there? And he said, yeah. He said, if you take them in there, Jay, they can stand there and watch with you, but they've got to be quiet and just stand on the sidelines. So after the matches were over that evening, like 10 o'clock at night, I took Scorsese and Cruz into the back room, and there was a big money game going on, a nine-ball game with several thousand dollars bet between Keith McCready and Danny Medina. And Keith McCready is Poole's counterpart to Stewie Younger. He's a, he's a, he was a fascinating character. Character. He was throwing out lines one after another. He he just he was he was that kind of guy. Anyway, Scorsese was enthralled by Keith McCready, and he sat stood there for about two hours watching Keith play, and just the whole dynamic of how he conducted himself and the one-liners he was throwing out to the crowd. You know, he would say, he would break the balls and say things like, take your places, balls. And if a cue, and if the cue <laughs> ball went in the pocket, he'd say, man overboard, stuff like that. He was, Keith McCready was an Amer, is an American original. And so after the tournament's over, um, Martin Scorsese wanted Keith to audition for a part in The Color of Money. And I was Keith's backer at the time. So maybe two weeks after that tournament was over, and Keith and I are back in Los Angeles, the only contact Scorsese had was my phone number. I was living in Venice, California. And one day I get a call from Martin Scorsese's office. And uh, the woman was, a sec was Scorsese's secretary. She said, Martin's interested in having Keith fly back to Chicago and audition for a part in the movie. And I said, well, I don't know if he'd be interested. And she said, well, you, can you contact him for us? And I did. I knew how to get a hold of him. Keith was down in Orange County. And at the time, Keith was uh, uh, busy playing pool and going to the racetrack every day. So I got a hold of Keith. It took me a couple hours, a few hours. I reached him through his girlfriend. And I said, Keith. They'd like you to fly back to Chicago and audition for a part in The Color of Money. He said, I'm not flying back to Chicago. He said, I'm busy right here. He said, if they want me to fly back to Chicago, they got to pay my way and put me in a hotel and pay all my expenses. So I called back to the office the next day and talked to the secretary. And I said, Keith's not really interested in going back there to audition for a part in the movie. Um, if they want him to come back there, um, they're going to have to pay all his expenses. And I thought that would be the end of it. The next day I get a call back and they said, Martin Scorsese he said, he'll pay for Keith to come back there and he'll put him up in a hotel. And I told Keith and Keith, sure enough, a few days later, he's on a plane flying back to Chicago and he didn't audition for the part. They took him right into the office. He met there. Keith says when he got there in the office, the outer lobby, um, he said there were a whole bunch of local pool players sitting around waiting to get auditioned. They brought Keith right in. They brought him right in as soon as he arrived, and he got the part of Grady Seasons. Now, there's more to the story. Now, Keith comes back to California, and he said, I got the part. Now, 
I get a call from uh, Barbara Delfina, who I think was Scorsese's wife at the time. She was the casting director. She said, we're going to send a copy of the script to you and have Keith go over the lines. So they mailed a copy of the script to me, uh, to my house, and I had Keith come up there, and uh, we read the lines. He had like six lines. And Keith's reaction to the lines were, he said, I'd never say that. He said, I'd never say anything like that. He didn't like the lines that um, uh, Richard uh, Richard Price, was the, was the script writer, had written for Grady Seasons. So I called back and talked to Barbara <laughs> Delfino. I said, Keith doesn't like these lines. And she put me on hold, and she talked to Scorsese. And Scorsese's message back to me was, Go ahead and write in the lines the way Keith would like to say it and put that in the margin of the script and send those to us. So that's what I did. I spent the rest of the day with Keith. We rewrote all those lines, and I think I faxed them to Delfino at her office. And guess what? They used the lines we wrote. Keith and I wrote those lines. And they actually expanded Keith's part in the movie. He got some additional lines in the movie. So that's how that came about, including the line. It's a it's like a nightmare, isn't it? That was one of Keith's Grady Season's famous lines in the movie. Keith wrote that line, you know. So um, Color of Money and The Hustler uh, were written by Walter Tevis, who's had a right. big resurgence because uh, Queen's Gambit uh, right. has uh, come out and people are loving that show. Now you knew Walter Tevis. How did that come about? Knew him well. Knew him well. Walter Tevis was a, people don't know. He was a world-class writer. He only wrote five novels. They were all bestsellers. Um, but unfortunately he was plagued with alcoholism and he would write and then he would go into a stupor for a year or two where he wouldn't write at all. He was also a professor of English literature at Ohio university. Um, so he, he had a lot of credits in writing, but, uh, um, Walter Tevis became friendly with me. He, he covered a tournament in Dayton in 1974 for Sports Illustrated, and he watched me play a match, and in the story in Sports Illustrated, which I still have a copy of, he wrote a couple paragraphs about me and the match I played in, and fortunately he wrote about a match that I won. So, and when he became friendly with me, and he became friendly with my mother as well. Um, I, in 1974, I was a 30 year old man. My mom was like 52 years old. And since we were from Dayton, she had flown back there to watch me play. Uh, in I actually, she was still living in Dayton at the time. And she came and watched me play, and she met, met Walter Tevis, and we went out to dinner a couple times during that week. And, uh, it turned into a friendship between my mother and Walter Tevis that I was not aware of until many years later. I don't know if you want me to say any more about that or not. Uh, no, that's fine. That it, it, It's just a um, sort of bizarre, small world kind of thing, you know. Well, what what happened years later... Uh, when my mother moved to Los Angeles, where I was living, it seemed like about once every year or so, Walter Tevis would come to Los Angeles on vacation and doing business with people in the studios and stuff like that. Remember, you know, they were they were in the process of making the color of money and, and you know, preparing for that. He did work on that script a little bit, although Richard Price, Richard, uh, yeah, Richard Price and Martin Scorsese completely rewrote the script for the movie it's that movie is does not follow the book at all they just use the name but walter tevis came to california frequently on the auspices of having business in hollywood i didn't know till much later that he was dating my mother she was basically his girlfriend or his mistress whatever i only found out years later after Walter Tevis had passed away, one day my mother said, I want to show you something. And she brought out a stack of letters with a ribbon around them. And she said, take a look. So I, I took one of the letters out and I started reading it. It was a love letter to my mother. And it was very personal. 
and about two pages long, and I read it. And I, my mother was a very attractive woman, even in her 50s. She was kind of a Marilyn Monroe lookalike. Anyway, and at the end, the letter is signed Walter, with love, Walter. I thought, who the heck is Walter? I had no idea. And she said, well, you knew him. I said, what? And she said, it's Walter Tevis. And I said, I was like in shock. The And the, the capper to that story is when Walter Tevis got divorced from his wife, there was a big, it was in the newspapers at the time and uh, about Walter Tevis. It was a big, uh, a, 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 a very uh, uh, Contentious. difficult divorce where they, were, they fought it out in court. And one of the things that came out is that Walter Tevis had a girlfriend and his wife was saying that he was spending time with his girlfriend and spending money on her and vacationing with her and stuff like that. Nobody ever knew who that woman was, but I know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so which, uh, um, what, what do you what would your sort of most uh, well known pool hall be among the players? Was it the one in Bakersfield or was there another that no, sort of gained no. the biggest notoriety? The most well known pool hall was the one that I helped build in the late nineteen eighties in Bellflower, California. It's called Hard Times. And Hard Times became a famous action room. We had big tournaments and big action and it went it went really strong for about 15 years where every pool player when they came to the west coast they came to hard times cuz they could get games they would play with people like Keith and Ronnie Allen you know and Richie Florence and and um uh the top mexican players Moro Paez and Ernesto Dominguez there were many big games there in fact there was one game Richard cuz you mentioned it earlier a uh, uh, pool player named Bob Hunter, who was from Grand Rapids, Michigan, came out there and got in a $12,000 game with Ernesto Dominguez. This is probably in the early, mid-1990s. And they put up $6,000 each. They put it on the light. And they were playing on the table all the way at the front of the pool room by the front door of the pool room. And there must have been 50 people all sitting around watching this match. There was a tournament going on on the tournament side, which I was running. And what happened is some guy ran in the front door, held up a 45 caliber big pistol, waved it around, and yelled out, don't anybody move. He jumped up on the pool table, reached up on the light, scooped up all the money, jumped down, ran out the door, jumped in the back seat of a Cadillac, and they sped off and got on the freeway, which was only a couple blocks away. It all happened in probably 30 seconds, not much more than that. And everybody was talking about it, you know. And uh, the funny thing is, you know, they didn't know what to do. They had an opportunity. These players had an opportunity to put that $12,000 in the safe upstairs in the pool room, and they opted not to do that. And after all was said and done and the talking was all over, they each put up another $3,000 and they started playing again. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Some so it really is... does happen sometimes, and it did happen there. All right. We have lots more stories from Toupe J. Helfert, but we have some commercials, and we'll be right back. The South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In April, the promotion is $500,000 guaranteed money madness. Two casino-wide promotions running at all time. The larger one begins at 10,000 and must be hit by 25,000. All active players playing when, they, when it hits receive $25 in free play added to their account. Immediately after hitting, it starts over again at 10,000. The smaller progressive runs in the range of 1,000 to 2,500, and it's going at all times. It expected the smaller one will be hit about three times a day. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. 
The game of the week is a new version of Dream Card. In many respects, it plays the same as the old version. It takes 10 coins, and periodically you get a Dream Card, where it becomes the best possible card. The difference is now you get the Dream Card less frequently, but when you do, it is typically a much better card. The way it works is before the Dream Card hands are dealt, three separate hands are dealt in the background with a Dream Card for each, and the best one of the three is presented to the player. The overall return is more for the new version than the old version. The exact payout is shown on the help screen for each of the games. All right, we're back with uh, Jay Helford. You earlier talked about Keith McGrady. Did you ever back him and for any big money Many times I did good. I backed many players in my life. I was fortunate because I owned pool rooms and I was making money and I was in a position to do that. But I picked my horses pretty carefully. And Keith was probably my best. I would say that uh, over a period of a few years, we won well over $100,000. And this is in the 1980s when it was a lot of money. The biggest score we made at one time, I put him in a tournament in Binghamton, New York. Um, it was a $500 entry, and this was like 1984, and cost me like $500 to send him there and, and uh, um, uh, play in the tournament, the airfare and the room and everything. Remember, back then, you could, you could fly a round trip across the country for a couple hundred dollars, and rooms were like 50 bucks a night. And... Uh, this was called the BC Open, and it was sponsored by the people that have that BC comic strip in Binghamton, New York. I forget the guy's name, but he was the sponsor. First prize was $25,000, and uh, Keith beat one after another, Mike Siegel, Jimmy Rimpy, Steve Miserec. One Every day he would call me. He said, I played Miserec today. I said, how'd you do? He said, I beat him. I played Jimmy Rimpy today. How'd you do? I beat him. And the funny thing is, in the finals, he was playing Mike LeBron, who was uh, um, a famous player out of Philadelphia, actually a mentor to uh, John Hennigan, who I mentioned earlier. Mike LeBron had won the U.S. Open. He was a top player. And first prize was 25000 Second prize was 10000 LeBron came to Keith and said, let's make a deal. This happens just like in poker tournaments at the end, they chop up the money. LeBron wanted to chop up the money, 25 and 10, 35,000. They could split it, get 17,500 each, a nice payday. So Keith calls me on the phone. I'm in LA. He calls me on the phone and says, uh, LeBron wants to make a deal. He wants to either do a saver for 5,000, so now it's 20 and 15, or just split the money. I said, what do you want to do, Keith? I asked him that. He said, I'd like to play for the whole thing. That's Keith McCready. He said, I'd like to play for the whole thing. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to LeBron with his backer and tell him what you just told me. He said, I said, go over there and say you want to play for everything. Play the match for the whole 35,000. And he did that. And he put LeBron in such shock that Keith beat him 11 to three in the finals and we won the money. We won the 25,000. He scared LeBron basically, you know? Oh, so, so, but LeBron didn't go for the, for the whole thing. The oh, no, play for the won. 35. No way. <laughs> yeah. He wanted, he wanted to make a deal to save money. Yeah. He was, yeah. So LeBron, Keith, we got 25 and LeBron got the 10, but there was an aftermath in that tournament. Keith had come to my house before he flew to New York and he needed a cue to play with. Keith always needed a cue, you know. And <laughs> How could one of the nights. top players in the world not have his own cue? <laughs> they listen. He he goes through cues like they're toys. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. I got to hang on a second. I, okay, I'm all right. Uh, anyway, um, Keith would play big money games and borrow a cue from the guy on the sidelines. He never, even when he had a cue. He never even had a case. He might carry his cue around with a rubber band around it, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, he was a char- He was an eccentric character. Anyway, so I let him try a couple of my cues that I was willing to let him use, and he didn't like them. 
but I had one very expensive queue, a, a Zamboni queue, which today are worth ten and twenty thousand dollars. Even then, it was worth several thousand dollars. And Keith tried my Zamboni. He said, "I love this queue. I want to play with this queue." And I was very reluctant to let him take it. But finally, he talked me into it. I gave my Zamboni. I said, Keith, take care of that cue. I got to have that cue back. So he goes to the tournament. He, he wins the tournament playing with my Zamboni cue. But while he was celebrating that night, after he won the tournament, some guy they called the whale. Jerry the whale. He was a notorious uh, bad guy in the pool world. He was a dumper and a grifter and everything else you can think of. He went to the front desk of the hotel and claimed that he was Keith McCready and somehow convinced them to let him into his room. He said he was locked out of his room. And they let him in the room. He got my Zamboni. He stole that Zamboni cue. So Keith flies back home to California. And I said, where's my cue? And he said, Jerry the whale stole the cue. And he tells me the story. And I thought, I got twelve thousand five hundred, half the money, but I lost a queue that was worth three or four thousand dollars. I was sick about it. About a week later, I get a call on the phone from a guy they call Brooklyn Butch, who's a notorious tough guy, you know, an enforcer around New York. And Butch calls me up and says, "Hey Jay, I heard you lost your Zamboni queue." I said, "Yeah, Butch, I did lose it." He said, you want to get it back? I said, yeah. He said, how can you get it back for me? And Butch was living in Glendale, California. He wasn't in New York then. And I said, well, he said, come out to my come out to my office and I'll, sh I'll show you how I'll get it back. So I drive over to Glendale and I go to his office. Butch calls up a pool room called the Golden Q in Queens, New York, and says, I want it. This is afternoon here, but it's evening in New York. And he says, I want to talk to, to the whale. And they get the whale on the phone. Now, this was before, you know, we were on cell phones. He was on a landline. And I'm sitting in the in the room next to Butch when he's talking to him. And he says, hey, uh, hey, Jerry. He said, I heard you got Jay's uh, Zamboni Q. And at first he wouldn't admit it. He said, no, I don't have it anymore. I hocked it to somebody. And Butch says, listen. I want you to send that cue back because I'm I'm a I'm a good friend of Jay's and I want that I want you to send that cue back. And at first he was very reluctant to do that. And I could hear the one side of the conversation I could hear. It didn't sound like this was conversation was going to do any good. And Butch finally says to him, listen, Jerry. If I have to, I'm going to get on a plane and fly back there to New York. And he said, you know what's going to happen if you see me. And do you know, three days later, that queue arrived by UPS in Glendale, <laughs> California. And I drove out to his shop, and there was the queue. And there was a box with the queue in it. And that, that was amazing that Butch was – I tried to give him a reward, but I had done favors for Butch before, helped him out with money a couple times. He said, no. He said, that's my favor to you. So I got my Zamboni queue back. When you when you back somebody like in a tournament or playing in a money game, what what's the normal split between the the backer and the player? Typically, in a tournament, you pay the expenses, all the expenses, including entry fee, uh, hotel room, even transportation to get there, and you take that money back off the top. So if it costs you a thousand dollars to stake a guy in the tournament. You get that. That's first money. You get that back first money. Everything else you split 50-50. But when a guy makes a big score like Keith did, I just chopped it right down the middle because my total expenses were probably about $1,000. So I told Gary Pinkowski, the promoter, called me. He said, what do you want me to do with the money? I said, give half to Keith and send me the other half. But gambling is different. Gambling is different. When you're playing a big money game, let's say – you're putting up 50000 your side. The player typically will get, depending upon how good they are, they will get anywhere from 25% to a third. And the rest goes to the people that put up the money. 
And sometimes they have to do makeup too, like in poker. If they lose, the next time they get you, there, you back them in a gambling game, they got to give you some of the money's got to come back to you off the top. When you were talking about hard times, you mentioned the name Ronnie Allen. Tell us about him. Ronnie Allen was the original Fast Eddie, and he was considered the best money player and the best one-pocket player in the world for about 20 years. And uh, he was he was kind of the mentor to Keith McCready. Ronnie had this over-the-top personality that anywhere he went, everybody wanted to see Ronnie Allen play. What he was famous for was not tournament pool, but he was famous for generating action. Um, I traveled with Ronnie several times when I was a young man, and he could go into a pool room where nobody ever bet more than $10 a game. And within a couple hours, he would have everybody in the pool room gambling on a game that Ronnie had made with maybe the local champion, where Ronnie might be playing a local guy for $25 or $50 a game, but we might be betting $200 a game on the side. And Ronnie would have me keep track of all the side bets. We might be side betting with eight or ten people, and I had to keep track of all those bets. And it would they would pay off game by game by game, where we might win two or $3,000 in this spot. And the amazing thing about Ronnie is he could generate this kind of action, and when it was time to leave, all they would be saying is, when are you coming back? When will you come back here again? Everybody loved Ronnie. And uh, he won some big money. He won. He literally probably won a million dollars in his life at pool, but he blew it at the racetrack. He was a, he was a degenerate horse gambler. And Keith picked that up, too. And Ronnie was, was in on some big scores, but he lost. He, he in, invariably, he ended up giving the money to the horses. So in the color of money, the, the idea of that movie was that road hustling was basically dead and that the only way to make money at pool anymore was to play in tournaments. Yeah. Um, is that accurate? I mean, it certainly doesn't sound like it at Griff's here in Vegas. There's huge money being no, bet. No, there's always been big action in pool. As but long I, as I've been around, there's been. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of the biggest pool action happened around tournaments. All the tournaments that I worked on and all the tournaments I went to, there was always a back room. And they kept the public out of there. And that's where, remember, tournaments are where all the players got together. So the top guns, there, there was just like in, in, in poker, everybody wanted to be the number one guy, the top guy. So they would match up in the back room and play. They would play for money. So, and oftentimes, the biggest money was won in the back room, not in the tournament. But how does that work? I mean, because nowadays, especially with the Internet and cell phones, like you – you can't really be anonymous anymore, right? I no, mean, if you if no. you show up in, I mean, so basically, the the guys playing all know each other, and they really know who the better player is, right? I they mean, did, so is it all now, about in the old day? In the old days, Richard, they didn't. And I, when I first started going to tournaments, the players didn't want photographers around. They didn't want their picture taken. They didn't want it. They want they didn't want their photo. Anywhere, the the I most famous hustler in, in back then was a guy called Frisco Jack Cooney. Jack Cooney won hundreds of thousands of dollars playing pool in the 1970s and 1980s. He would go places to where there were bookmakers or pimps or guys with a lot of money that were playing for big money, and he would come in. And lay a trap that might take him two or three months, but he would end up gambling with this guy and winning. We would hear, it seemed like every year back in the 70s and 80s, we would hear about Jack Cooney taking somebody off for 100000 or 90000 And that was at a time where if you won four or 5000 you won a lot of money. And he was unique in that respect. And the amazing thing is, most of the players didn't even know what he looked like. He 
He was that anonymous. The majority of the pool players did, would not know Jack Cooney on sight. He was good that way. I knew him personally because I knew him from San Francisco, but I was in a, the minority of players who would know Jack Cooney. But nowadays, he, he, they do all know each other, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Nowadays, you can't hide. So it's about it's how, you, how you match up? on a phone, and they put it on the Internet, and they know who he is. So is it all about how you match up, how you make the yeah, game? Yeah. Now it's all about matching up. There's big games going on right now. There's big money games going on right now. But they know each other. The mo- Listen, when you see a big money game in pool, it's all the backers' money. One side backs one guy and another side backs another guy. And there are some very wealthy backers in the pool world. I'm talking about guys that are multimillionaires that think nothing. Listen, there's a guy that's the heir to the to the Mars candy fortune. You know, um, uh, he's one of the heirs who he's got to be worth hundreds of millions. He has. He has no qualms about backing his player for a half million or a million. If, but the problem is they can't find backers for the other side. So typically they end up playing for amounts like 50 and 100,000. Are spots offered where one side gets an extra ball or gets something? Oh, well, all the time. All the time. There's a, The big games like the games I was talking about at Griff's with John Robert, he's being spotted. Huge handicaps. In one pocket, people give him games like they have to make 14 balls in their pocket, and he only needs to make four. But, you know, they're playing for big money. Most games, there's some handicap involved. Now, with Ronnie Allen, there was rumors that he had a gaffed pool cue. Oh, yeah. Uh, Is that illegal and... are are the rules as to what what you can do with a pool cue? Pool de- yeah, there's definitely rules in tournaments, but in gambling game there are no rules. I used to when I used to gamble at one pocket, I would stipulate that I could get up on the table because I'm pretty short and I can't reach down to the end of the table a lot of times in one pocket. So if they if my opponent let me scramble up on the table to reach a shot, I could reach any shot. It was a big advantage to me. Ronnie Allen was famous for being able to play one-handed. He was the greatest one-handed pool player. And after a while, nobody would even play him their two hands to his one hand. He was that good. But he developed another spot where he would take the shaft off his cue, and he would play with the shaft only. And he would play good players and use the shaft only. But no one knew except a few of us, because he would never let anybody touch the shaft. He had a shaft made that weighed 15 ounces, whereas a normal shaft might weigh 3 ounces. He had a he had a gaff shaft made that weighed 15 ounces, which is as much, much as the weight of, uh, uh, of a light pool cue. And he could play very good with that shaft. I remember I knew a pool player back in Chicago when I was a backgammon player, who was always trying to get me in a game, and he would offer to play me one-handed or with a broomstick or, you know, he had all kinds of hustles to try to... <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't play. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who is Shane Van Boning? Shane Van Boning has been the number one pool player in the United States for like 15 years. He's 36 years old. He's considered one of the three or four best pool players in the world. He's won he's won more tournaments and more money than any other pool player in the United States. Um, and he typically would win six, seven, or eight tournaments every year. Um, he made a good living. Now, a good living in pool is maybe with his sponsorship. He's got several sponsors that are probably paying him fifty to a hundred thousand a year. He probably makes a few hundred thousand dollars a year. But that's not a bad living. Now, what's interesting about Shane is he's a deaf mute. And um, finally, the technology got there when he was in his 20s where they made some kind of earbuds that he could insert into his ears where he could hear reasonably well. He told me something years ago that I never forgot. 
he told me that it was harder for him to learn how to talk than it was for him to learn how to play pool. Because he couldn't talk when he was a child. He couldn't talk at all. And even to this day, he talks with kind of a slurred speech. He talks kind of like this. How are you today? You can understand him, but it's a very affected speech pattern. But what a lot of people didn't know, that he used to his advantage when he was young and first starting to play pool and play and Shane can play. Shane would play tournaments and he would play, he played he's played many big money games as well. He's never been afraid to do afraid to do either one. But Shane, when he was sizing up his opponents and they would be across the room talking to their backer, trying to decide what handicap they need, he could read their lips. Shane can read lips across the room. And I would sometimes be standing with talking to Shane side by side. And he would tell me, he said, see those two guys over there? I said, yeah. He said, they're talking about me. <laughs> so people didn't know that. He knew what they were saying. If he could see their lips, he knew what they were saying. So the last story we're going to get from you today is happened at the Tropicana Hotel in 1980. What was that all about? Oh, that was that was a great tournament. That was called that was the World Pro Am, and it was an eight ball tournament put on by a promoter named Richie Florence, who was in in partnership with a, a couple of pro football players. Mike Battle was one. He was a famous football player from them, and they held the tournament at the Tropicana Hotel. And he had the entry fee. I think the entry fee was $500. I played in it. But they attracted a huge field of players, like several hundred players played in that tournament. And there was added money. First prize was $27,500 in 1980. Big money then. And they played the tournament on what we call bar tables. The, ter the tables you see in, in taverns um, to this day. They were seven-foot tables. And the reason they played it on bar tables is because it gave an advantage to lesser players. It was easier to play on. And there's far more players that play on bar tables that, and that play on big tables, the full, the official nine foot size. And that's how they attracted like 600 players. Anyway, they play the tournament down to the finals. And when it gets to the final two players, Warren Costanzo, a guy they called the monk and Mike Siegel, who was a top, top tournament player, one of the best players, they decided to play the final match on a nine-foot table, which seemed very unfair to Monk Costanzo. But that's the way they set it up. So they play the final match on a nine-foot table, and Mike Siegel is a four-to-one favorite, and everybody's betting on the match, and they're laying four-to-one on Mike Siegel to beat Warren Costanzo. But miracle of miracles, Warren Costanzo plays the match of his life, and it's a race to 11, and it goes down to where um, Siegel is winning the match 10-9, to 9, and he's running out to win the match. And somehow, he made a grave error playing position from the 8-ball to the 9-ball. All he had to do was make the last two balls, and he got corner hooked by the side pocket. The cue ball stopped right in the jaws of the side pocket, and he couldn't see the nine ball clearly, which was right on the side rail. If the cue ball would have stopped a quarter of an inch sooner, he would have had an easy shot in the nine. As it is, he had to shoot a masse shot just to hit the edge of the nine ball, and he did it. Mike Siegel executed a great shot. He hit the edge of the nine ball. And he caused the nine ball to go down to the end rail and the cue ball to come back up table to the other end of the table. Monk Costanzo was faced with this table long cut shot, thin cut shot on the nine. Nobody thought he could make it. And there was a huge crowd, several hundred people watching. And Monk stu studied the shot for two or three minutes before he got down to shoot. And the whole room went silent. And Monk was so nervous that he got back up and he said, he said, I'm really nervous right now. And the whole <laughs> crowd started laughing. He said, and, and 
somehow that relieved the tension. Monk got back down. He stayed back down for 30 seconds. He shot a very firm stroke, hit the nine, edge of the nine ball, and he made the nine. And he made the nine ball. And now it was what we call in pool, hill, hill. It was 10 to 10, one game for the match. And Monk, Sieg, Monk Costanzo got to break. He broke the balls, and the nine ball went right in the pocket, and he won the match 11 to 10, and he promptly fainted on the floor. Oh, my God. But I actually, I, I remember that tournament. I went to it one day. Um, the Tropicana, people don't realize this, but in the old days, downstairs at the Tropicana, they had indoor tennis courts. Yeah. And and they took over the tennis courts and put all those pool tables down right. where the tennis courts were. Right, right. Um, they were all the little – they were all bar tables. And, but you the know, final as, match as, they played on a nine-foot table. As big as these casinos are now and as hot as it gets here, it's kind of surprising that none of the places have indoor tennis courts anymore. Um, although yeah, maybe the um, – you know, maybe the Weston still does. I don't know. Um, I know the Orleans is the only one I know of that has a bowling alley. Yeah. Oh, a lot of map, a lot of oh. the station properties. South have Point definitely alleys. has bowling alleys. Yeah. Sam's oh, they do. Samstown has a bowling alley. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Have you written any books telling about your adventures? Oh, thank you for asking. I, as a matter of fact, I have. I wrote a book in 2009 called Pool Wars, which is about 40 short stories all about the pool world and famous hustlers of my era and the reason i wrote it more than anything else is because a lot of the the famous hustlers the only way you knew knew of them was oral history no but there was never anything written about those guys you know so not only did i tell stories about people like ronnie allen um uh, but i put photos in there there's like 70 photos in that book that have never been published anywhere before that are because remember, these old time pool players, they didn't want their picture taken, but I found photos of them and put them in there. And Pool Wars was a bestseller. In fact, people continue to buy that book today. It was so popular that six years later in 2015, I wrote a second book called More Pool Wars, which expanded on those stories. And those are available on your website, and we'll, yeah, put, you, we'll put a yeah, link you can, to your site. Um, in the show notes so that people can find you, find your site, and uh, be able to order the book. Yeah, it's just j jhelford.com, and you yeah. can find them. But Pool Wars now has a publisher, and if you just put in Pool Wars on the Internet, there's many booksellers, yeah, many bookstores and retailers that are selling copies of that book. But more Pool Wars you have to get through me. Pool Wars also is available as, a, as an e-book now through Amazon and iTunes and Barnes and Noble. You can buy it as an ebook. Okay. Jay, we didn't come close to hearing all your stories, including you've actually had considerable success playing poker. We'd like to hear how you did in the World Series of Poker. Is there any way we can twist your arm and have you come back and see us again? Oh, I'd love it. I'd enjoy it. Yeah, and we yeah. didn't even get to uh, talk about Minnesota Fats yet, so you definitely oh, have yeah, to come back to talk about him. Oh, yeah, that's a great story how he became Minnesota Fats. Yeah. And his court battle that was on the front page of the newspapers with Walter Tevis. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It was a very pleasurable hour that we spent with you. We look forward to doing it again. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Okay. Good day. Thank you, guys.